Our first guest is a world-renowned Sasquatch field researcher, but he's probably best known as one of the team members on Animal Planet's hit show, Finding Bigfoot. Here to share more about his lifelong passion, we welcome to AM Northwest, Cliff Barrickman. Good to have you with us. It is nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay. Do you really believe in Bigfoot? Well, you know, I don't like the word believe because okay. that kind of implies thinking something is real uh, despite a lack of evidence. But there's a ton of evidence that Sasquatches are, in fact, real. And for me, it's also a like, do you believe in dogs? Of course you do. You've seen one. I've seen a Sasquatch. I know they're real. There's no question. You have seen one? Yes, I have. Where did you see one? North Carolina in really? Uari National Forest. And what did he look like? Well, this is through a thermal imager at about 2.30 in the morning. Okay. It was walking on a wooded hillside without a light. Um, and it's about 70 yards away. Uh, one of our uh, team members went after it. it. It totally evaded that person, despite the fact that that person had a uh, night vision monocular and also a thermal imager. We also got vocalizations off the same hill. So I saw it for about... 10 or 15 seconds, not very long, and I didn't get a really great look at it. I was using technology, a thermal mm -hmm. imager, which sees heat in the middle of the night, so a, a mammal stands out against the background. Okay. Um, but yeah, Bigfoots are absolutely real, and it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of evidence. So you brought some evidence with you. Tell yes, me about I did. this. Um, people ask me all the time, what is uh, the best evidence for Bigfoot? And they expect me to say something like the Patterson-Gimlin film or something like that, but really, after studying this field for so long, I find that the best evidence for Sasquatches being real animals is the congruency of all the available evidence. If you, uh, and I brought this one piece of evidence. This is a, a footprint cast from Grays Harbor County, Washington. This was cast by a sheriff, a guy named Dennis Hereford, who now works for the state government of Washington in mm -hmm. Olympia. Um, this one cast shows a number of features that are congruent with other footprint casts and also shows features that you can see in films. Um, for example, if you look straight down the tube here, you can see that the, um, the toes, I call it, the toes kind of are expanded off to the side. Mm -hmm. It's something we call the mushroom effect. And that's because um, just like your feet, Sasquatch feet have a soft pad underneath it, a fat pad mm -hmm. to kind of absorb the cushion of walking. And when a Sasquatch walks into a muddy area with a hard packed uh, subsurface, the fat pad expands laterally when the weight is pushed on it. When the weight's taken off, it goes back in. And so you can see a concavity to the outside of the footprint cast here. That cannot be duplicated by a fake wooden stomper. And this... Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, and then of course this uh, crack here down the middle of the foot, that is also a function of the same soft pad on the bottom of the Sasquatch foot. Because when it pushes down, it expands laterally and pulls the dirt away from the other areas, thus making this crack. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. These bumps on the outside of the foot right here, they correspond to where the metatarsals meet the phalanges inside the foot. And if you look, I would say they look like corns from wearing high heels. <laughs> well, some people speculated that, but it turns out that we can look at this cast and a number of other casts from the data set, and those same marks are in a number of different casts. Hmm. So they must correspond to the spaces between the bones on the outside of the foot. There are only three bones on the outside of the foot, so these two bumps correspond to the spaces between them. And if you compare that to a human footprint, they're pushed forward on the foot about 16 to 19 percent of the way, which turns out is exactly the necessary redesign of a human-like foot to carry a mass of the size of the Sasquatch. So it's a biolocomotion thing. Mm -hmm. So all of this data fits in together and is congruent with other pieces of data and the films that we have. It's amazing. Why do you think then, what's your theory behind why they hide? Well, they hide the same reason bears hide or any other animal hides. Because they, when they are seen, they are vulnerable. Now, I think uh, uh, to take that question one more step. Um, why are they seen so rarely? They are seen kind of a lot, and I get a lot of reports all the time. But why are they seen so rarely? That's a combination of their lifestyle being nocturnal, um, uh, the fact that there are very few of these. There, are, there aren't tens of thousands of them in Oregon or Washington like there are black bears. Mm -hmm. There's probably just like high hundreds to a, maybe a low thousands in the entire Pacific Northwest from Northern California to Alaska. A few thousand sounds like a lot. But if you take 2,000 individuals and you take away all the paved land in Northern California to Alaska, that's over 275 square miles for each individual Sasquatch to roam around in the woods and not be seen. Are there any outside of Portland? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The closest area that I'm aware of that have had sightings right outside the Portland area is right off the Sandy River over by Oxbow Park. Mm -hmm. And um, up in Forest uh, Hills, actually, there at Forest Park, there have been sightings before. In fact, every year, a 
smattering of sightings comes in from just north of there on Pumpkin Ridge Road. Wow. Okay, so do you think they live in families? Do you think they live in twos? I mean, how do you think they live? Well, if, and when you look at primates, and Sasquatches are certainly primates. Okay. Um, when you look at primates, there's a number of models of the way they live, and one of the models is called a family group. It's what humans tend to do, although we're kind of tribal at the same time. Mm -hmm. But um, Sasquatches, based on footprint find evidence, based on evidence and also visual sightings, they don't live in troops like gorillas or chimpanzees. Okay. They live in small family groups. And we're basing that on a number of footprint finds that indicate there's a large male, a smaller adult, and maybe one or two juveniles. Now, these individuals are probably spread out over a large area. They're not hanging out holding hands skipping down the street. Okay. They're over a large area, five, eight or more miles in every direction. Where did you get this passion for a Bigfoot? Well, I have always been weird. Okay, I'll <laughs> put that out right away. Um, ever okay. since I was very, very young. I remember four or five years old, I had Bigfoot on the brain at the time with the legend of Boggy Creek back in the 1970s in search of that whole thing. And I've always been really interested. And I'm, I'm a fairly smart guy. I'm pretty eccentric. I've always held that interest in the th in weird things, you know. But it was in, when I was in college, I had a few hour break in between classes. Mm -hmm. And I would go into the library and I, you know, I'd, I'd just pick books off of the shelf and subjects I was interested in, mostly science because I have that kind of mind. Um, one day I found myself in the anthropology section and I read a book that was a, uh, a, a collection of journal articles written by anthropologists on Sasquatches. Hmm. Now those journal articles were mostly written by uh, um, uh, well, uh, cultural anthropologists, pardon me, um, because they were talking about, okay, why is it that every Native American tribe that lives in suitable habitat has a name for Sasquatches in their oral history? Oh. Why is it that um, there, there are uh, carved ape heads found on the Columbia River that predate white contact. Why is it that all these native tribes have artifacts and stories and long history with these creatures or creatures that basically fit the description? And of course, then I started reading about the physical anthropology about it, about the bone structure and all. Yeah. And I realized, holy smokes, not only are these things weird and quirky like me, but they might be real. Yeah. And that was over 20, 25 years ago now, and I've been drowning in the subject ever Cliff, since. I wish you would get more excited about this. I, I you really know what? Do. I'm holding I myself really back do. right now. You it know, was like, fascinating talking with you. Thank you very much. I am always happy to talk squash. <laughs> All right.